Jonathan's argument caught me off guard. It was our second date, fifth conversation, and I was snuggled, snuggled up in the corner of his cozy leather couch, watching the night sky over the beach from his living room window. I had a glass of red wine in my hand, and I was feeling flirty. But he, he persisted. Look at the number of black doctors today versus the 1900s. You can't deny the progress. The evening started with Indian food and making fun of the recent Bee Gees documentary. Then the late nine conversation wandered from witty nonsense into a political minefield. The topic? How great it was to be black in 2021. Jonathan, who is not black, had come to the conclusion that being black was vastly improved by every measure that he cared to count. And he wanted me to corroborate his belief that this whole business about racial injustice and strife was but a minor nuisance and soon to be squashed for good. Jonathan looks a bit like Jason Statham, the British anti-hero known for being averagely handsome. I don't know why Jonathan mentioned doctors to make his point. It was random, but maybe he had seen that viral meme, a tweeted image of 15 black medical school graduates standing in front of a former concentration camp for enslaved Africans. Some call it a plantation, but that's just one of too many words that make brutality sound quaint. The doctor photo was actually something I knew a little bit about because I'm a nerd and a former journalist, and as they say, my people are from Louisiana, so I pay attention when it's mentioned. Most of the stories about the viral post were hopeful and very celebratory. Definitely, I definitely hearted more than a few hashtag our ancestors' wildest dreams posts. But only a few stories noted, as I shared with Jonathan, that in reality, the percentage of US doctors who are black has barely risen in the past 120 years. And almost no story noted that black women account for most of the increase because the number of black male doctors is currently in decline. Why is both complicated and not at all complicated? Scientifically, biological race does not exist. It is a social invention. That's why intelligence exists equally across every so-called race, gender, socioeconomic, religious, and ethnic group, according to common sense and research. <laughs> it is only opportunity that does not exist equally according to world events. Jonathan did not like my answer, but apparently he still thought I was cute. He texted me the next day. I was polite, but I didn't make an effort to keep the conversation going. This was not my first Jonathan. <laughs> it was a, I, <laughs> I was about 28 when I first dated a white guy. Not dating white guy was, not dating white guys was not necessarily intentional. The men I attracted just tended to be melanated. But there was a time in college when I thought I'd never date a white guy. A classmate from Nigeria and I agreed that they seemed like a lot of work. <laughs> I once used the analogy of walking next to someone who's floating six inches off the ground and doesn't understand why you're so damn tired after a day of hiking up steep hills and through muddy canyons. But in hindsight, that analogy isn't fair. And maybe it's more like two people carrying book bags, one weighted down with textbooks and the other carrying a few, a few paperbacks. After all, not all white guys float. <laughs> Jonathan is entitled to his opinion about race in America, but he doesn't get to mansplain social progress to me. My mother drank from a coloreds only water fountain in the 1950s. I'm sure that too was celebrated as progress because it is the same water. Jonathan's argument grated on me and I knew it was best to walk away and not look back. That was Thursday. Saturday afternoon, 
he sent me a 200 word good morning text that arrived at 1.23 in the afternoon. In it, he outlined five key points. <laughs> points two through five were about an early 2000s R&B singer, the yacht rock music genre, <laughs> a movie recommendation, and his confession that he spent 45 minutes composing the text. I'll just read the first point. <laughs> What follows is from the actual text exchange. I did not alter his words, but in some cases I trimmed for brevity and clarity. <laughs> I looked up a few articles on the shortage of black male doctors, and while I agree, the data roughly show that there are slightly fewer African male, African American male doctors now. In my humble opinion, there is actually quite a bit of nuance to the story. Therefore, I conclude the issue does not seem to merit um, a good logical basis for complete pessimism. Sorry, exclamation point. You said you wanted to meet a person who views the world with a little optimism and curiosity. Guess what? You got him. I think he was trying to be charming, <laughs> but I'm not a pessimist. I am a realist, and it tickles my ivories when people think a handful of black doctors and lawyers erases the wealth gap and countless disparities in this country. I knew it was better not to respond. I knew this was a trap, but his pious taunt worked. Four hours later, I thanked him for his note, but said I would not thank him for the link to Yacht Rock. It's horrible. <laughs> then I warmed him to read the message at his own risk. He had mentioned in a prior phone conversation that my contradictory tone uh, or opinions about the state of black people in America had triggered him. This is not an argument I wanted to have. I said, it's great that he wants to look to the world with optimism about the potential to correct centuries of deeply entrenched prejudice and oppression. I have reality. Tiny little slights and mishaps that affect me, my career, and my ability to just exist on a daily basis. I don't need platitudes about how great everything is because in 1900, 1.3% of doctors were black and in 2018, 5.4% were. I told him that he didn't have to convince me that it was great to be black. Social construct or not, I love being black. I do not see it as a burden. I see the rest of the world as fucked up, but I absolutely 100% would not choose to be anything other than exactly who I am or Oprah. I would totally choose to be Oprah. Has there been progress? Yes. Has there been enough? Absolutely not. Should we be happy that it's now egregious and not whistle at a white woman in the street homicidal? Jonathan called himself an optimist. Great. Tell that to the homeless guy on my block yelling, I hate N-words, at the top of his lungs because he thinks that as bad as he has it, at least he's not one of those. And yes, I know that dude probably has mental issues, even though it's not a pleasant spectator experience. I haven't always been the girl who speaks up for herself and have a pile of regrets about micro and macro aggressions that I did not respond to because I knew that it was safer or smarter to say nothing, lest I be labeled angry. I was surprised to be having this particular disagreement with Jonathan because did he really care so vehemently about whether the full potential of black people was soon to be realized? Or did he think having a disagreement with, about race with a black woman somehow threatened his woke white man card? 
Jonathan has the luxury of trusting <laughs> that things will be better eventually. I don't. If true justice and equality, equality emerged from kindness, compassion, or optimism, that would have happened already. I told Jonathan that I absolutely believe and see the world is changing and improving every single day. I also believe the robot overlords will handle this better <laughs> because they know biology and statistics and they won't care what brown cream or tan shell we come in. I wrote over 750 words. Jonathan responded three hours later with five words, two punctuation marks, and an emoji. <laughs> OK, comma, thanks for your perspective, period. White thumbs up. <laughs> When I read the message to a friend, she said what I'd been thinking. Damn, that's like white people code for fuck off. <laughs> Lesson learned, I did not respond. Still going. Hey, Deborah, was thinking about you this morning. How you doing? I truly hadn't expected to hear from him, so I said I was confused, <laughs> but good. OK, glad to hear. I thought a fair bit about the text you sent me. It didn't seem like you in it was intended to spark discussion, so I wasn't really sure how, what to reply to. Finally, I came to the conclusion that I'd probably learn the most by asking you the following question. <laughs> what would be the perfect reply that you would like to receive that would validate the effort your thumbs put into composing that message? Your reply above all above indicates that maybe I was right and that you weren't trying to evoke a response. Of course, I did already reply. <laughs> Not sure if you got it. I thanked you for your perspective. You remember the white thumb? Okay. <laughs> I didn't hear back from you, so from my side, it was actually you who stopped the conversation. Anyway, I was thinking about you this morning because I was packing my car to go surfing at 5.30 this morning, and a homeless man rode by me and said, have fun, and then yelled a derogatory term insinuating that Jonathan might be homosexual. <laughs> Jonathan ended the sentence by inserting a crying, laughing face emoji. Then he said, there you have it a fun little experience that made me think of you <laughs> and prompted me to reach out. Please help me out by understanding what is the best possible response that you could possibly have received. If you thought it was fun, I I'd even invite you to compose it in my voice. Thanks, exclamation point. I snapped a screenshot, <laughs> sent it to another friend. We agreed that this definitely felt like a men are from Mars and women are not moment. <laughs> Me writing a response to myself sounds about as satisfying as a side hug. <laughs> I'll be honest. I still thought maybe writing back to Jonathan would spark some light bulb moment. And he'd realize that maybe he doesn't understand everything about being black in America. But Jonathan wasn't trying to learn. He was too busy trying to win. Nevertheless, I wrote and explained that there wasn't a perfect answer, but I would have appreciated a message that reflected some sign of humility, genuine empathy, and understanding.
good morning. <laughs> Thanks again for your response. I agree that we have different modes of communication, possibly even orthogonal. I had to look that word up. <laughs> it, it means at right angles. Anyway, he continued. I personally won't attribute it to gender because I don't find that to be a productive line of reasoning. Heck, some people think gender is as much a construct as race. <laughs> I'll leave that to them to decide. But I found that in practice, most people prefer to be addressed as individuals, not a series of demographic boxes that they check. Yes, I actually am triggered by almost every communication that we've had, including the most recent text. And yes, even when I first met you in the park, there, to me, it sounded like you were insinuating that I was stupid for not wearing a bicycle helmet, when in fact I had considered very seriously whether or not I wanted to wear my helmet that day. I do not remember that. <laughs> he then conceded, I am willing to chalk it up to different communication styles rather than actual ill intent on your part. Doesn't matter. I have persisted thus far because we have enough commonalities to possibly build a friendship, but different enough perspectives that I might learn something. Asking you to construct the perfect response was a genuine intent, attempt at learning and growth on my part. What does a white whale tell a person who says that white whales can't tell them anything? And yes, I just have to say, I thought white whales was a typo too. <laughs> but he just kept using the phrase, capital W white, capital W whale. He explained that in situations like this, white whales either give up or wise white whales ask a question and try to learn more. <laughs> then Jonathan reached his final conclusion. Most of what you wrote was an expression of pain. And as you explained, you want that pain to be acknowledged. I hereby acknowledge you. I am indeed sorrowful for and empathetic to your pain. I try to act, vote, and organize with that in mind. Okay, that's about all the time my effort and effort my thumbs can afford. I give up for now. So I'll end by saying I have learned a few things. Have a great week, and I hope you meet the kind of people you need to here in San Diego. Vaya con tacos. Taco emoji, sunset emoji. I thought about responding with, don't call me Ishmael. <laughs> but I didn't. No. That was our last exchange. <laughs> I read a book once on the righteous mind by another guy named Jonathan. It discusses why it's virtually impossible to change what people believe because beliefs are not logical and most people are perfectly comfortable holding blatantly contradictory beliefs. White whale Jonathan wanted to agree <laughs> to disagree. He thought his optimism was a gift that could ease the pain that he hereby acknowledged but his optimism felt dismissive. I don't carry the same load my mom did, but I carry a much different load than Jonathan for reasons that won't be resolved in my lifetime. My pain isn't what he thinks. It's not pessimism. My pain is my optimism, my hopefulness and my ability to see the world's potential my confidence that someday in the future, people will joke about us the way we joke about cave dwellers. At every stage of civil rights progress, good-hearted white folks have said, isn't it great how far we've come and expected us black folks to be grateful? How many failing to recognize that anything short of appreciating our full, complete, God-given humanness is unacceptable? Jonathan called himself a white whale, and now I think it was Freudian. 
that maybe he sees himself as the object of an obsessive pursuit, not realizing that he's only a focus because he's standing in the way. The only pursuit of reciprocity is justice and fairness, not revenge. Jonathan's reluctance or, igno or ignorance about acknowledging the precarious state of race relations is telling. It's the kind of ignorance lurking beneath the surface of modern civility that um, James Baldwin called the most ferocious enemy justice can have. But Baldwin was also, had also great faith in humanity. Trust life and it will teach you in joy and in sorrow. So I'll leave you with an odd bit of joy. Last week, as I was preparing this talk and researching Jason Statham, <laughs> for purely professional reasons, the guy, that's the guy who Jonathan sort of looks like, I found out that Jason is in a sequel to a film I've never heard of. In it, he battles a giant white prehistoric fish. I know it's a stretch, but I just had to tell you. <laughs> I don't know exactly what the universe is saying with this bizarre message, but I think it means that we have to keep our sense of humor, face the demons lurking deep in the past, or there will be awful sequels for years to come. <laughs> Deborah Bass, give it up.